Bordeaux. That's right. It is Bordeaux on this edition of Outside the Vines. We're talking on the 5th of July, so there's never a bad day for Bordeaux. And and I'm so no. lucky that, that joining Glennon and myself is of someone I've gotten to know through the years who has been a friend, who has been an incredible resource in teaching me, uh, a, a New York kid that grew up drinking Budweiser, uh, teaching me about Bordeaux. Ralph Sands, he's the senior wine and Bordeaux specialist at KNL. KNL is a, it was a Bay Area based, uh, just outstanding wine merchant. Uh, Ralph, in 1990, made his first visit to Bordeaux to evaluate vintages. He has since visited Bordeaux 55 times, escorting over 300 customers on Taste the Greats of Bordeaux tours. He has tasted in 15 different states in America. 2003, how about this for an honor? Chateau Pichon Longueville, if you uh, know your Bordeaux, you know that well. Nominated Ralph for induction into a special society. I won't go through the long name, but it was as a Bordeaux educator and ambassador. He was inducted that July. Uh, Ralph is a huge San Francisco Giants, 49ers and Warriors fans. I think that's how we first connected when I was uh, calling games for the Giants. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we'll, we'll get into a little more of the, of the personal uh, stuff as we go through. But um, I just I'm so excited for Ralph and Glenn to hook up because with Glenn's advanced wine palette and knowledge of the business, this is phenomenal. So let's start. Ralph, San Francisco guy, Bordeaux. How'd that connection happen? You know, Ted, I didn't make it in baseball is the, the, the answer every time. Yeah. For, for 40 years here, it just didn't happen. I tried hard. I had a couple of tryouts with the Giants, um, and I hit the ball really well the second time. And I was offered a, car, a contract by the Cardinals when I was 19. I would had a very good freshman year of uh, college, and I was really starting to, to blossom into my body, and it was quite shocking that they called me and offered me a contract. And um, I really kind of wanted this college experience, and I wanted thought I was going to be a big player at UCLA or some place sporty. Didn't happen. I, I turned them down, but it was $365 a month and a ticket to the Appalachian League the next week. <laughs> and my father was sitting there, and I said, I almost made that much money at the recreation department working part-time. So I turned it down, uh, and they I said, you know, keep watching me. And uh, I ended up loving baseball so much, and I, I took a couple of years off. I went back for my last year at San Francisco State because I loved it. And um, I had a really fun last year of baseball and uh, enjoyed enjoyed it immensely. But my father was getting a little bit upset with me laying around the house at an advanced age for baseball player. And he said one day, uh, go down to this liquor store in Millbrae and get a job. And I'm still at that job here 42 years later. <laughs> so, I mean, so that... That's the question, though. So you're saying, I mean, it's California. It could have been Cab. It could have been Zinn. It could have been. How did you land and become so proficient at Bordeaux? Well, you know, I have the, uh, you know, I started, I was very so shy when I started this. I could barely talk to people. But then I got put in this retail situation where people were down my throat because when KNL started, they started a little bit illegally. And we were selling product at a little lower than the, than the government uh, would like you to. It was called fair trade. And so um, the owners of KNL thought that this was going to get tossed out. They were correct. So um, there were people every, every day in front of me ordering gobs of booze. The wines in those days were four liter jugs, one and a half. Anyway, I lost all that um, shyness. And um, after a while, the, one of the owners, Mr. Clyde Betha, one of my mentors in life, uh, he w- he liked wine. The other owner was not a big wine fan. But eventually, uh, Clyde walked in the door one day in 1981, with a, and he stood in the doorway at 9 o'clock, and he said, Ralph, go get some wine glasses. We're going to change our business. And he held up a bottle of 1981 Pichon Lalonde, which had just arrived in America, and he said, and this is 9 a.m., and he says, I, my job was to watch the cash register to make sure that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> and so he, he goes, I'll watch the cash register. You go get the glasses. At 9 in the morning, we tasted this wine. 
He said, "This we're going to change our business and tell everybody if they don't want to learn about wine that they should get another job immediately. And I had this just little bit of wine fascination from my uncle Ralph, who was a, a bon vivant a gentleman in San Francisco. He was a member of the Bacchus Society. Uh, and so I used to hide in his wine cellar as a little kid. And um, I used to see the pictures of all the chateaus. It intrigued me to no end. Ralph, do you, can you still remember that first, that 81 piece on Long Review, Le Long? Do you oh, remember? Yeah. Do you remember what it was like? Yeah, it was, it was a little cedary. And that's kind of the note that stuck out. It was dry, which was much different than the 74 and 75 Mondavis that I was tasting around that time and, and, uh, and after that. And so that wasn't as sweet. It was dry. It was very fresh, had great aromatics. And that's what really got me was the aromatics were so different and they were so fresh and they were so effusive that they lit, like filled up the room. And, uh, so that, that just intrigued me so much that I started reading everything I could read. Uh, and then we started tasting huge amounts of wine on Wednesdays at the store I managed, which was my day off, by the way. And they put the tastings at my store on the day off. Still haven't forgave them for that one. But I showed up every, every Wednesday. We would taste 100 wines from all over the world. And, and many of the greatest wines were there. I, I didn't know it at the time, Lafitte they, and some of the uh, DRC wines and thing, things that I just didn't know of yet. And, you know, Glenn, we, we did uh, one of our episodes earlier, and I had just done a little bit of passive, I guess, somewhat or cursory research. And I remember we said Bordeaux in the 60s was mostly white wine. Ralph, I mean, I had no idea that Bordeaux, before my awareness, certainly, and probably, you know, before you were involved, was a white wine or majority white wine. A lot of white wine because that's the the drinking wines of the European community. You know they make so much wine in Bordeaux. It's one of the the largest producer of fine wine in the world. So the base of the European uh, drinking community was drinking from the Entre du Mer uh, and higher appellations, maybe uh, the the Grave appellation that we're going to taste today. But um, yeah, the uh, even even in Burgundy, Sasson Montrachet was uh, two thirds white at one time, and and now is is of course mostly red, but um, they 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 figured it out. And um, the the thing that's so un, that I I like to point out to people is that the advances that have been made in Bordeaux in the last 30, 40 years is amazing, and it's a two way street. California learned from Bordeaux and Bordeaux learned from California in different aspects of winemaking and business. Uh, so many of the things that were happening in California, they were intrigued with in Bordeaux, but they were a little hesitant to try because change comes slowly in France all the time. So it takes a while. But and then but in, in by the late 80s, people started working together, you know, the. And as, as uh, Glenn knows, the the uh, Opus One uh, collaboration was was one that it was a really kind of open communication too, between open the doors to everybody to share information, and uh, and the winemaking quality just went straight up everywhere, especially with the white wines of Bordeaux, and and that's why I'm pouring this wine tonight. Um, there's a method to my madness here because. The, the wine that we're tasting is an outstanding example of really high-class Bordeaux wine at not a crazy price. And the prices can be crazy for some of the whites. The man who uh, we're going to taste the white wine for, uh, Denny Dubordeaux, was uh, a progressive, uh, one of the greatest assets ever in Bordeaux for white wine. He was trained at the University of Bordeaux by Emile Peinot, who is the like the godfather of of uh, French winemaking because he cleaned everything up and made everything so, mm -hmm. so beautiful that, and, and all those practices, winemaking practices have carried on. And so we've, uh, even the inexpensive white wines from Bordeaux 
The wine we're going to taste here has got some oak to it, not tremendous, but oak influence. But a lot of the white wines that are very inexpensive from Bordeaux that you see at k and and maybe other places also that are $10, $15, the greatness of those wines is 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 the is the purity of the fruit, the cleanliness, and the freshness that they're bringing from top to bottom. Now, that's should we um, actually we should probably since we've referenced it a few times, let me, uh, let me pull this Clos Floridian, yeah, as you referenced, twenty seventeen Floridian mm-hmm. Blanc, and Ralph, why don't you tell us a little bit more? Because Glenn, you see, Glenn, I'm going to pour mine. Tell us a little bit more about this particular. So, this particular wine uh, was is is like my own little personal homage to one of the greatest white wine and wine consultants in the history of Bordeaux, a, guy, a gentleman named uh, Denis Du Bordeaux, yeah. who passed away a few years ago. Uh, this was the estate that him and his wife bought when it was really small, two or three hectares, I believe, in '82, and they were both scientists and. Um, he was from a winemaking family. Uh, his uh, f- he grew up at Chateau Doisy uh, Doisy Dane in Sauterne. So, uh, and then he eventually attended the University of Bordeaux. And when he he was considered the white wine guru, he just cleaned everything up. There were a lot of wines in the seventies and eighties that were very flabby, and a little overripe, no freshness, and lots of herbal tones. He got all those out of there, harvesting early, freshness. Not uh, You don't need a lot of skin contact. Um, you know, some wines you do, some you don't. But anyway, uh, the, his, this is uh, his home estate that has grown over time uh, uh, in hectares. But uh, I think it's just the greatest example that I can find in Bordeaux, high-class white Bordeaux that um, is affordable. And you know this wine, as you can as you can tell, you got you get a lot of this. Uh, uh, one of the the qualities of great white Bordeaux that I adore is white flowers. When when they taste, when they smell like jasmine, I I just love that. I adore that. And 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 be fresh. So this wine's got some weight, mm-hmm. as you can see. It's almost Burgundian in its weight, but uh, you know it's it takes it sees about. Uh, Eight to ten months of wood, but there's there's only like sixty percent new. It's got all that lemon mm-hmm. and citrus, but you let the wine set a couple of years, and you start to get that base of the semillon that's coming up and and gives you that broadness, a little bit of nuttiness to the wine, almost texture, and so my favorite food pairing with this is uh, scallops right mm-hmm. off the barbecue. With uh, you know a little balsamic or in olive oil and and this this wine, you can compare this wine to wines like Domaine de Chevalier, uh, which is four or five times the price. Revered, I love it. I collect it for special occasions, but this wine uh, has all those hallmark characters. You know the richness, the white flower, the nuttiness, um, a little salinity in there also, and so. I think it's just a, a great, great wine, uh, especially if you get a little, give it a couple of years to what we call set, let the wine set, let it find itself and you know, integrate. Ralph, you know what I, what I like about this, and you use that word, it's it's crisp, it's fresh. There is, absolutely like you said, the Sauvignon Blanc, that acidity is there and you, and, and you taste that. But on the nose, as you said, there's that jasmine note. There's almost a little bit of, um, um, Kind of the overripe, uh, kind of a, I hate to say this, but like a, a golden raisin note, but it's just so slight on the back. It's that sweet perfume of that flowers give when they're everywhere and you smell that. It's so, um, it's just, it's incredible. And then there's an unctuousness, an oiliness to this that I think you mentioned scallops, I'd say meat of a sort, but um, we have, uh, lake trout here where i'm staying right now and if my son gets one tomorrow this is going with the lake trout it's a big meaty fish that has a lot of oil in it yeah that's a great pairing uh sea bass is also great with it you know this it goes a long ways little it pate is good too little white cheese 
Nice. So, Ralph, if I went into a supermarché or a Nicolas, a nice wine store in Paris, would I find Clos Freuden on the shelf? Yeah, you definitely would. Yeah. Uh-huh. You'd be in the higher end section, but yes, you would. Okay. And no um, But they make another wine there uh, that they property they own, which is also I'd like to mention because it, it's a le- they use a lot less oak. So if you want a little uh, – sappier, zippier version of this, you can buy their other estate, which is called Rainon, R-E-Y, uh, R-E-Y-N-O-N. And so uh-huh. less oak, same kind of uh, procedures, but lots less oak. So, um, uh-huh. yeah, this would be in the higher end side of the uh, yeah. of the sell- uh, selection. But that's still, and, and that's something, you know, on the general Bordeaux theme, that I've always found fascinating in my trips to Paris is that you go into basically the food, the food stores in Paris and you find terrific wine that you'll have for dinner that night at a most, because you're having it every night, it has to be affordable. And that has always struck me. I didn't understand that, Ralph, until I started spending more time in Paris is how good the daily wine is. Yeah, the fresh wine, you can't beat it. I mean, it's everybody gets caught up on the famous places and yeah. the first gross and the second gross and all of those things. But um, the, the, there's there's so many wines out of Bordeaux and the winemaking is so good. Uh, now, it's just it's just a, it's a great time in the entire world for wine. It's just amazing. Everywhere you go, the quality is great. Uh, there's no underperformers anymore. Or you kind of get shamed out of the business. There's so much competition. That's, but even before the pandemic, ay ay ay, it was. Uh, there's, there's the especially in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's the most competitive market in the world. Everybody wants to sell their wine here because of our wine regions that surround us. So mm-hmm. we've got we've got competitive pricing here, very competitive marketplace, and uh, the market's flooded. There's so much wine, and it's all good. That's the great thing. I'm, I'm thrilled about that. Wow. Well, that, that Clos Floridan, and, and we'll put this in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the bio summaries on the YouTube page, et cetera, so you'll find a little bit more out about this wine. But that's terrific, and that's a, a great discovery for me. Glenn, uh, you hit that perfectly. Why don't we uh, shift and take a little bit of the red you bet. that you tried for us. This is a Le Petit Au Lafitte. And, uh, by Smith O'Lafitte 2015. And again, Ralph, go ahead. I'll let you describe, and then you and Glenn take over the uh, the tasting. Well, uh, the one thing, uh, so this gives the sports angle on this wine, and this is the place where you want to take mm-hmm. your signi- significant other for your significant birthday, honeymoon, anniversary celebrations. The, um, the wine mm-hmm. itself comes... Uh, is about a 60-40 blend, which is uh, 60 Cabernet over 40 Merlot, which is pretty normal for the Grave Appellation. So uh, the Grave obviously is gravel, and the, the, the Grave Appellation was planted well before the Medoc. So this is uh, the Grave Appellation and farther south in Sauterne, uh, where the first area is in Bordeaux mm-hmm. on the left bank of the giron Garon River that were planted. And... The, the sports angle here is just marvelous. Uh, Florence and Daniel Cafetiards are my friends for many years now, and they're beautiful ambassadors of wine and athletics and uh, love America. They've been here many times promoting their wine with us at K&L. Well, they were both on the 1968 uh, French Alpine ski team in, uh, in Grenoble, huh. which was very close to Daniel's home. They were both down downhill skiers, and they were alternates. And I don't even think either one of them actually um, participated, but they were there. And uh, in those Olympics, if, if you if you remember back that far, Jean Claude Keeley won three of the he swept the the downhill events. And so after that Olympics, Daniel's family had been had done very well in the supermarket business he went he went in with his wife florence into the sporting goods business with keely they did very well <laughs> they did very very well so but um the cat yards had a had a plan 
that when they got to be 50, they were going to do what they wanted to do the rest of their lives. And they've done it. And bravo to these folks. They said, we're going to, we're going to buy a big chateau. And then we're going to have, we're going to build a spa in the hotel in the middle of the vineyards. And we're going to make great wine. And people laughed at them, belly laughed. But when the Cathy Arts bought it in 91, people said, this is why they said they were crazy. The place is way too big. It makes horrible wine. It's going to take so much money. You'll never do it. They did it. It's marvelous. And, and the wine's marvelous also. And, um, so that's why we pour it. It's a 15, which is a really beautiful, friendly, well-balanced mm-hmm. vintage for Bordeaux wines. And and that's that's why we pour it. As you can see, the tannins are not aggressive. It's a pretty smooth wine. Did they, were they the, Ralph, were they able to buy this because of the success they had in the business with Jean-Claude Keeley? Was that connected? The culmination of all of that. I mean, they, they went all yeah. in for this. I mean, and, and the thing that I thought that really kind of bothered me uh, is that this was a beautiful place. And they had a, but the French did not automatically support them because it's out. They, oh, it's down there in Leon. It's 20 minutes away. Who would go down there to hang out? And, you know, if you live in Bordeaux, well, that, that TGV to Bordeaux for Paris certainly didn't hurt. Um, no. This uh, destination resort, which is no. now one of those Relay and Chateau place, it's book 365, and it should be, because they treat people great there. That's the deal. When you go there, uh, the owners find you and say hello if they know you came from the wine <laughs> and if I sent you there. So, Glenn, what's, what's your well, from the rent? Well, I lo- you, like you just said, it's friendly, right? And, and you said it's in that international style. Not heavily structured tannic bomb. It's not. It, this is not lasting fifty nope. years. This is the type of thing when you go into if, if you're having a night out with your family or or a significant other, and you're at a you know an overpriced steakhouse somewhere. This is the one you, you say, "I'll take that off the menu." It's probably going to be priced right where you want it. It's right now perfectly where it needs to be as far as taste and structure. The Merlot comes through big because that's what softens it and makes it so nice. Exactly. And it's got a lot of fruit. Yeah. It's got, it, it really is there, but yet it still has some of the total profile of Bordeaux. You get that little bit of that, um, you know, a little lead in there a little, or, or flint as some people call it, or lead pencil. Yeah. And you get a little fit, a little spice on the finish. And so it's very a nice. Smoky. You're right. I don't think this, yeah, a little small. I don't think this lasts a long time, no. but I think it's probably amazing for the next eight to twelve years. And I think you're, you'd be really happy here. Absolutely, this wine. I, I know I'm really happy with this wine right now. Yeah, it's, it's smooth. It's easy to drink. Uh, it's beautiful, beautiful ripe fruit, not overdone, uh, not overripe, not underripe. It's it's just about perfect. You know, uh, it's not a not a sports story, but. These, these people at Smith Olafide, very, very competitive folks to this day. I mean, they came to America, poured their wines, and it wasn't unusual for either Florence or Daniel to disagree with each other in front of a packed house full of people because, <laughs> because they're into it. And, you know, and, 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 and they brought their um, genuinity to, to everywhere they went. People said, I like you. I'm going to, I'm going to buy your wine. And, and then you go to their home. And so the, it's, it's really worked well, but what I thought when I, one the short, uh, short one I wanted to share with you is, you know, so they bought this place in 91, turned it around by darn near 94, started to make some wine. And then after that, they really started to do it. By the time they got to the two thousands, they were doing it. But when they went, as I mentioned before, the, the estate was real big. So, they had made white and red wine. They're classified there to make both and in the Grave. And so they, they've got two winemakers because they didn't know if they could, did they have, a, have to have a winemaker with a red wine or the white wine or well, how that was going to go. So they hired two young winemakers. And after about 10 years, you know, they both wanted the job to, to, be, to do both. And so... They were, the family was torn, didn't know what to do. So they had a silent vote to see which winemaker they were going to keep. And the, the gentleman they kept is Fabien Tangen. He's still there today. And the, the other gentleman, 
went to Chateau Obaye, which is right around the call, the call, Gavilar Vilars, went right around the corner to Chateau Obaye, which was, was bought, uh, bought uh, by an American businessman, uh, Mr. Uh, Wilmers, in 98, opened up the checkbook. This little place was old and needed tremendous love. But it was an ancient riverbed vineyard with some old vines that go back over 100 years old to this day, still included in the blend of Obaye. But anyway, both of these really talented winemakers, because they were so competitive, they both landed in great spots mm -hmm. and uh, from the silent boat. So yes. pretty cool. So, so Ralph, I, I want to um, I, I want to get to some of your sports stuff yeah. in, in a minute. But while we're on that topic of, of chateaus, you were so unbelievably kind to my wife and I and set up these visits for us in Bordeaux. And I lost track of the years. I had to look it up today. It was seven years ago, which I can't believe. Mm. But well, you, yeah. you you connected us to visit Chateau Margaux, which – and you, you talked about Bordeaux learning from California and California learning from Bordeaux. One thing that I didn't see in Bordeaux – there were no signs pointing to Chateau Margot. <laughs> There's no welcoming. Come no. On, visit us. No. Uh, and and I we spent one hour there. So that was the that was the routine. It was the most illuminating, fascinating, educational hour that I could ever have experienced. And the last ten minutes was in the tasting room at ten forty five in the morning when our tour assistant from the chateau opened up a, 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 a Margot, I think, two, I forget the 2007, 2008, something like that, and spit it out. And that was the memory that just, you know, you have this amazing experience. And of course, she was a taster, so she was just used to doing that. I, I was so blown away. Talk, for those who haven't had, obviously most haven't had that experience. How do you get connected? You, at your position in k &L, get connected with Chateau Margot and, and, how, why is it so different, that experience, than any winery we'd be used to in California? Well, that's the great question, Ted. I, I always tell people, it's the opposite of California. It's completely <laughs> the opposite. But at least I, was, I got to go there so many years ago that I learned the etiquette of how, you know, how to approach these people. And, and, and I think that with, with the K&L connection, over the years, these they see the job that we do on the other side of the water from them. And so if Ralph Sands is sending you a good client, they're going to take care of you. Outside of that, you have to, it's got to be a more formal approach. You can't drop in. You got to write them letters. You got to, you know, beg and grovel if you need, if you need to. But that's changing because the world's changing. And they built a new bridge in Bordeaux a few years ago. I think they did it in a year that goes up and down and lets the cruise ships in. So these everybody knows a few of the most famous estates, but you can't get in those places. It's very difficult. But this is going to evolve. It has to evolve because the world is rediscovering the city of Bordeaux, which used to be pretty darn dumpy. There were many areas where I was told, no, 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 don't be walking around at night because that's the only free time we had where I, I needed to go walk around, run in the in the older days. And um, they'd say, no, you better not do that. It was really a dark, dank uh, place, but it's not. They cleaned the entire town up and and it's a beautiful place. And the tourist numbers, it's it used to be like the eighth busiest place in, in France. And now I think it's third or fourth. And so they've redone the entire uh, promenade of the waterfront, which was the the cutest Chartron, where all the negotiants had their, their businesses so they could roll the barrels right onto the boat at the water. <laughs> I mean, it was all about, it was all about business. Yeah. And now all those dumpy places on the water, it's a beautiful promenade. People come to Bordeaux and say, this place is beautiful. And I can go to the wine country. So 
it has to it has to kind of change a bit and i think that change is coming but there's never going to be any big signs pointing yeah. you to Pichon Lalonde or Chateau Margaux. So, so, it's not going to happen. So I, and I showed I showed Glenn this. I remember when I came back from that trip and Glenn and I started working again together. Mm -hmm. And I know Adam Gordon, our producer, I've showed it to him. I have a video of something I was blown away by that Chateau Margaux has its own Cooper. <laughs> Full time yeah. Cooper. And if I remember correctly, I believe he said he makes 50 barrels a year. About, about, one, yeah, about yeah. one barrel a week by hand just for Chateau Margaux. That was another mind bending, uh, you know, realization. Yeah, there's, there's, um, you know, it's all about the wine. Everybody that works there, it doesn't matter if you're the janitor or the person picking the grapes or the, or the, uh, the guy who's the, the head winemaker, who's also the head winemaker at Inglenook. It, it's all about the passion of, of that. And everybody lives for that year. It, there's something about it. It's just uh, once you get into the wine business and the the um, motion of the seasons, it gets to be second nature. And, uh, you know, in France, it's all about the food and the wine. And, you know, I've, I've been blessed to uh, been able to discover it and uh, to taste. You know, I probably tasted well over 150,000 wines in my life and, and some of the greatest ever. And, you know, whew, I'm a pretty lucky guy. And. When I send people there, they know we do the job for them at KNL. So it, it works both ways. Ralph, great segue into sports right there in that in the sports world. Now, I grew up in California as well, Southern California. And for us, it was the seasons of fruit, you know, not just the harvest of the grapes, which were part of it, but summer fruits and, and the strawberry season and all those different things. But in football, everybody lives for that season. Your entire year is based around that one thing. And to get there. And I think that's why so many athletes take a passion in wine, whether it be baseball, hockey, football. It's that you understand completely the cycle of an entire year, not the week to week or the day to day, but how to look at the entire year as a culmination and where you're going. And I think you just spoke volumes about the relationship between the two is that. That's exactly how you look at it in sports. And I think that's why we all get into wine because we get into it and we, once we get there and we see the different seasons in the vineyard and we get to be at harvest or whatnot, and then bottles exactly. and all the different things. It's like, wow, this means so much to be on the same cycle that we're always on. Yep. It's so much to so many. And at the end you get the final result. You have to live with it for good or for bad. And you have to move on from it. Because the next season's coming, <laughs> and and you have to be ready for it. Yep. And uh, the thing about the wines of Bordeaux versus the California wines that I want to make sure that I got in here is that they they're grown in such different uh, climatic atmospheres. You know, you draw a line around the world, and uh, Bordeaux intersects the west coast of the United States. You know, north of Salem, Oregon, so colder much colder, different uh, latitude. And the um, the wines are different because of that. And the and the, the weather in, in Bordeaux, I my, my word for that after all these years, it's turbulent. It can be great, but it can be nasty. And at many different times of the of the year, you know, Bordeaux, can have there's numerous things that happen in Bordeaux that people are scared to death of that people never think of here. Frost at the beginning of the season is not nobody thinks about that here in California, where frost killed a huge percentage of the vines in 1956. That's why Bordeaux is almost completely replanted in 57. And um, it's too bad they didn't have the clonal knowledge that they have today, but they went with what they had, and that's what we have. But um, so you've got you've got this frost that can just wipe you out. Uh, you can have cold, nasty, or great weather in June when I do my tours, and I've experienced them all. When these guys are flowering, it can pour rain. It can be windy, and you, you, those those nodes blow off, and you don't have any grapes. So that doesn't happen in California. In the middle of the summer in California, it's a piece of cake. Uh, in Bordeaux, you can have vicious, violent hail storms. They can knock your, your, your berries right off the, the vines. Um, so 
The fruit set can be tough in June if you have bad weather. In the middle of the summer, it can give you hail. They're scared to death of that because, boy, destructive hail. If you look at some of that, those pictures on the Internet, they can kill the vine too, knock all the grapes off. It's terrible. And then uh, here in September and October, I can't remember the last time it rained in October because my birthday's in November. <laughs> Never rains until about the 17th. And, but in Bordeaux, you can have a beautiful, perfect harvest on the vine, and it can pour rain sometimes. And these these berries can uh, soak up the water and, and break, uh, complete dilution, loss, loss of fruit. So... Um, but then again, sometimes that rain can be your saving grace of a grape vintage because of dehydration in the summer. Uh, and that's the, the big deal here is Bordeaux's dry farmed. You don't water your grapes. That's why it, the, the vintages, there's a very big difference in these vintages. If, if the vines are showing hydraulic stress in California, you turn on the drip irrigation, everything's good. I was I was playing golf at Chardonnay Golf Club and the and and the drip irrigation's going on the vines, and I told my friends well, that never happened in Bordeaux, and it's true. All right, Ralph, tell us because you uh, and and K and L and the the uh, K and L branch that you work out of is in a town called Redwood City, California, which for decades was also the home of the 49ers during the dynasty yes, years. There training set up. Their headquarters were not far away from where your store is. Uh, you're a 49er fan. I'm guessing that that led to some interesting meetings. It did. And the best one, my big story, I got two stories, is that uh, one day this man walked into my store in the morning and he came up to me and he said, listen, I don't know anything about wine, but I need I need a, about eight or nine bottles of white and red. <laughs> and I, they got to be pretty good, but I don't have a lot of money. I said, okay, no worries. I'll take care of you. I picked out the wine. I brought it to the counter, and I said, here you go. You're going to be okay with these. I like these. He says, thank you. He, So I'm, I'm going home. In those days, I'm wearing my Giants hat, my T-shirt, my jeans, and I'm with my briefcase, and I'm walking out. And he, this guy pulls back up in the car. That's not the best sign in the wine business when they come back the next day. I mean, the same day. <laughs> so I'm looking, and I'm going, and he jumps out, and I go, oh, this isn't going to be good. And he says, hey, hey, I'm so glad I caught you. you. really helped me out today. I said, I did. He goes, yeah, you picked out the wine for me. He goes, this is my first day on the job. And my first assignment, I went into my new boss, a guy named Bill Walsh. And he said, son, you have a very important job today, and that's to get the wine for the coaches meeting. So um, he throws me. He says, while you were getting the wine, I heard these guys talking to I, and I asked him if you were a 49er fan. They said, yes. Yeah. So he goes, so I brought you a practice jersey. He throws me a practice jersey. Thank you very much. And I'm happy I'm going home. And he says, I'm going to tell all the guys about you. It'll be great. Okay, thank you. So he calls me a couple weeks later. He goes, you know, I'm not going to be much help to you. I got all these young guys. They're all drinking kamikazes and tequila. And But there's this really nice young Italian boy that wants to learn. So were you going to be around today? And he, he wants to come up after practice. I go, okay, yeah, sure. I'll be here till five. Got to be here. He'll be there four thirty. And it's Joe Montana. We're the same age. We're the same height. To this day, um, anyway, I taught him a lot about wine. We did his first cellar in Atherton, and um, he he was a really great guy to me. And it, and he was really good for K and L. Joe Montana walking around, not bad for business. Um, <laughs> And then other guys came after, but Jerry Attaway was that coach, and he has uh, four Super Bowl rings. Close friend of mine, I took him to Bordeaux in 2005. Uh, and another 49er named Ron Ferrari, who went yeah. to Illinois, he also went – He, I'm still in touch with Ronnie, and he went to Bordeaux with me uh, in 08, I believe. Joe Montana from Western Pennsylvania, if he is become as knowledgeable as you say in wine, you've been some professor. Western. Well, no, he wanted he, yeah. he he was into it. Yeah, he really liked it. I think it was a nice. It, I think it is a really nice. Um, you know, they love food and wine at their house. The white and his wife was in in also, and uh, they drink wine. They drink you know wine with their meal every night. So they were just naturally Italian people. 
so it's fine. So you know, because uh, uh, you're meeting Glenn via our our gathering here, Ralph. Glenn, of course, has a lot of history with Robert Mondavi, having spent how many summers there, Glenn, or off seasons, I should say. Uh, uh- the five or six or more. Yeah, every off season I used to go in there. Um, I was very lucky when when they offered to let me come up and and over the years I've spent time um, in all aspects. But I just really have been blessed because of how friendly that family was to me in in the, the time I was in the NFL and and I still can stay in contact with several people at the winery to this day. Yeah, they were they were phenomenal. Well, that guy, I got to tell you, Glenn, I can't wait to tell you this story because, you know, as when you're athletes, you know, you, we're, we're a little more tense than some guys are. It's certain, you know, a little bit. yeah, a little bit more. And, and that's good. That's what drives you, right? Drives me to this day. But I always wanted to talk to Robert Munda. I wanted to write him a letter and say, hey, can we go have lunch? And I never did. I felt terrible. And then when they uh, when they put me into that wine society in 03, they actually asked me to be in in 02, but I once I got home, I was honored. I was very excited. I realized my boss is not in that wine society, so there's no way in hell I can be in that wine society <laughs> without Clyde Beffa. Yeah. So I got back to Pichon Lalonde, and I said, hey, I can't do it because Clyde's not in there. You should put Clyde in there, and don't forget about me, please. <laughs> and they didn't. So they put him in at Chateau Carbonneau, and then I got to go the next year at the 250th anniversary of Mouton Rothschild, at Mouton, at Mouton. So, and I'm staying at Pichon Lalonde for a week with my wife, which was to this day, just marvelous. So we're flying over business class, which was very unusual for me in 03. And um, get, I'm visualized, I can see first class and guess who's up there? It's Robert Mondavi. I go, oh, and he's 90. Yeah. And, and I can't, I go, I can't go up there and, and disturb this guy. I just can't do it. It's not the right thing to do. So I'm not going to do it. So, but I knew that they were, that they were going to have a, a birthday celebration at Mouton at this party I was going to. So we land in France. Everybody's running out the, the, the plane. Like, you know, there's some kind of problem and, and they're just running right by Robert Mondavi. He's trying to get out. So I said, this is my chance. I get up and I go up and I stop right in front of him. And I say, after you, sir. And he looks up at me because he's hunched over and he says, thank you very much, sir. I go, oh, no, the pleasure is all mine. And his wife, Marguerite, was right there. And she said, thank you. So anyway, I got that moment with him, which was really cool. And then we go to the party at Mouton where we're drinking at the table, 82 Mouton, <laughs> as much as you can drink. It was, to this day, there's nothing like that I've ever done. And the white wine was Aubryon Blanc. Oh, so nice. I had a night. Now, Mondavi's at the party. It's in this pavilion. They brought a crane in to bring his birthday cake over and, and bring it in. And uh, they had a big stage. The musical guest was Placido Domingo. So I'm telling my wife, this this is it. Never going to get better than this. But Robert Mondavi's there. And um, Baroness Philippine de Rothschild gets up on the stage, welps, welcomes their great partner, Robert Mondavi. And they bring in this cake by crane. And I, I'm almost crying because I love this guy so much. And then everybody, they, they say, let's sing happy birthday to Robert Mondavi. And about half the crowd stood up. The other half didn't. I was pissed. I felt like yelling. You don't know what this man did for your wines. Because without Robert Mondavi's great vision, Napa Valley would not be what it is. And by a long shot. And the appreciation that Opus one, Robert Mondavi, boy, you know, and the advances of California uh, techniques and marketing, they all used it over there. I was a little upset that these people weren't standing, but bottom line, it was, it was really a cool thing to get to uh, honor him and they did it right. He was such a, 
what have I had the, the benefit of sitting in his office with him several times and talking with him, stayed at his guest house on his property uh, at Sil- off the of Silverado Trail. Uh, just a wonderful man who was, uh, and as you know, full of energy, just mm. full of energy. And I just, and, and I use him as a, a marker in my life all the time because I'm at the stage where he was when he started Robert Mondavi Winery when he was dead broke at the age of 53. And here I am at 55 going, if Robert Mondavi can be can do what he did in his life after being broke at 53, I've got the world ahead of me going on right now. So I'm always looking at that next thing because of the time I got to spend with him. Thank you for sharing that story. That's outstanding. Yeah, yeah that was you know, and you're right. He's he he's uh, mov- motivational to me to this to this moment because, you know, um, the the world never stops. The wine business does not stop. It just keeps evolving. And that guy had freshness, and he brought it every day. And uh, that's what we try to do at KNL. Okay, okay, Ralph. Let's wrap with one more thing. We had on our uh, second episode, I believe, Rich Aurelia. And Red Stick. Yeah, and again, cool. you with your love of baseball, your background in baseball. I don't know. I don't know if you've had a chance to to meet Rich, but you know, you would you must know about the wine and what he himself oh, no. has done to to invest himself in the wine making process. Yeah, no, I got really lucky uh, because uh, I knew of his wines, and he approached K and L, and I got an email from the young owner, which who doesn't contact me often, says, "Hey, go into the tasting bar and evaluate these wines for me." Yeah, I want the honest opinion, the young owner. And uh, so I, I, I did. I said, I, I go, I think the wines are solid. I think that, that the Pinot's the better of the two wines, is the more interesting of the two. But I like I like them. They're fruit forward. Uh, they're tasty, the most important thing. You, they got to taste good. And um, and I like the price. is not crazy. It's, it's in the right spot. So that was my feedback to him. And then I was walking out of uh, – a, a, a beautiful day at Pebble Beach that I was watching some golf and I'm walking out and to be honest I've had some wine all day long I'm having a beautiful day at Pebble Beach and we're we're walking out and I'm with my buddy who has young kids and he he says we got to go now and was walking out Rich really is standing there pouring his wine and I said to my buddy I got to stop and talk to this old shortstop because I'm an old shortstop and but this guy was a really great giant and I was a big fan uh because one of my buddies and I had this running argument. He said, Aurelia will never hit. I go, you're wrong. He's got to play every day. He'll hit. Okay. And he hit. So anyway, I stopped by and I said, boy, it's good to see old shortstops out here peddling wine. And he doesn't know who I am or anything. So he's, he goes, we like to taste the wine. I go, I've already tasted the wines. And I said, Hey, I'm actually from K and L and, uh, and rich comes and he goes, your buyer's name is Ryan. And I went, that's impressive because most people don't know those kind of mm-hmm. things. And then right away, right away, I said, you know what? Very impressive, Rich. You're out here selling your wine. This is a tough market. Lots of celebrity wine just come and go, but you're out here. And this is what you have to do to be successful. He was with his business partner, who I've met before, nice young guy. And this is how you're successful. You have to be out there. This People who are paying you know, seventy, eighty hundred dollars for wine. There, to keep getting that business, you have to have a relationship. The wine has to taste good. You have to want to keep drinking it. And I, I think that they've got a really unique um, business model because you have Dave Roberts down there in L.A. still coaching a K and L customer. I will also mention, and uh, in our Hollywood store, and then you got Rich. But they're they, they're worker guys. They they know that. You just can't throw it out there, and it's going to be great for everybody. They know you have to to work, and uh, so I think they're going to be successful because they keep they keep their business model in you know close. They're not overgrowing. Oh my gosh, that's the big no no. Once you have a little bit of success and you start adding, you got to keep it focused. Take care of your direct to customer base. Sell some wine at retail at the at the good shops, so you're in there. I, I think they're doing it right, quite frankly. Well, Ralph, thank you for doing this with us. Uh, Glenn, what do you think? That's two nice wines we had a chance to sample, huh? Absolutely. I've got a white for Lake Trout tomorrow and a red if I pull a <laughs> steak out in the next day or two. So thank you so much. Ralph. All right. Thanks for the stories and the education. 
Uh, my okay. great pleasure. And thanks Thank for having me. I appreciate it. And if you have a picture of that trout, you can send it all over here. If not, go to the store. We're going to get Glenn right. through the Bay Area, Ralph, so you guys can meet face to face. And uh, listen, in, in the show great. description, we'll put the two wines that Ralph uh, had us enjoy tonight. We'll also put about k &L. If people want to uh, contact you who see this and pay, that guy knows what he's talking about. I assume, Ralph, they can find you by email, right? You betcha. I'm easily accessible, answering the phone good, at k good. Ralph, right. cheers. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, k &L, thanks you too. So uh, keep drinking those good wines and travel safe. Thank you, Adam, for everything.